It was before uh, most of you were born, 50 years ago. But it was uh, on April the 4th in 1968 that Martin Luther King was assassinated. I can still remember that time we were living in Dallas and word came at about 7 o'clock that Martha, Martin Luther King had been killed. And there was this sense of grief and anger and there was this sense of hopelessness and because of what had happened to President Kennedy just five years earlier, this was the sense of not again. And you knew that there was going to be a wave of, in many ways, justified anger through the community that was most represented by Martin Luther King. And there were places all over the country that, where that was the place. As uh, events unfolded, it was hard to imagine that one man who became quickly a suspect, James Earl Gray, had changed so much in the country. And then as uh, he wasn't arrested for several weeks, and then it was in London, and there was questions about how a single man could not only carry out the murder, but how could he escape and get to Canada and then get a forged passport and get to London, and he came back. A year later, he confessed that he had done that particular act. But then, not long after, he recanted his confession. And that fed into all of the conspiracy concerns and all of the wondering concerns. How, how could a loser like him have such a skillful kind of plan to do it? How could the international things be involved? And so all kinds of questions began to emerge. And then there were government inquiries. There were lawsuits. The King family wasn't persuaded that he had done it, and they pressed on right even to the present that something else happened on that particular day. So there's all kinds of questions and all kinds of concern. Now support in the middle of this, I was to walk forward and say, I've got some inside information on what happened. And some of the things that even that Martin Luther King, in those last moments as he was standing on that motel balcony, was thinking, I, and I, I've, I've got a document that helps us understand that. And I was to say to the people who are leading the investigation, uh, I'm willing to produce it. And they would say, well, how did you get this document? I said, well, I, I, it's actually a pretty old document. It was written a thousand years ago but it gives a wonderful inside information at what happened at the assassination of Martin Luther King. How, how credible do you think I would be thought of? A document written in 968 AD, a uh, AD, thousand years before the killing of Martin Luther King. But that's what we're doing this morning. We're opening a chapter in the Bible, a psalm in the Bible, written a thousand years before Jesus was crucified, that describes in the most stunning detail what happened on that day. And in some ways gives us insight into uh, the cross that we don't get even when we read the New Testament. That, that is surely absolutely impossible, except for one thing, and that is the intervention of God himself. Now, let me notice some things with you about Psalm 52 before we look at it and open and read it. it. It is written by David. And yet, as we read through it, the thing that is remarkable is that there's no known experience in the life of David that quite fits it. Second thing that's obvious as you read it through, it's describing an execution. Not, not simply the killing of somebody, not the murder of someone. It is describing an execution, but an execution of a particularly intriguing kind, one that uh, didn't exist in the land of Israel until uh, almost a, a thousand years after David had written. A third thing about this psalm that's striking is that it's written by an innocent man. He, he appeals to God, but there's no sense of guilt. There's no sense that he's done wrong. There's no sense of confession that this is not the way it ought to be. In David's Psalms, we'll often have that. He'll, he'll often talk about lamenting his enemies, and he'll say, I, I know I've sinned in the middle of it, but this isn't because of my sin. But there's nothing of that in this psalm. 
The fourth thing that's evident as you walk your way through the psalm is that the psalm has this connection to the New Testament events that is striking and significant. And the fifth thing that's there is that it is a psalm that is quoted more than any other psalm in the Gospels. As a matter of fact, the very first verse we hear on the lips of the Lord Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there'll be six other passages that are quoted in the New Testament as a reference to the events of that day. And there's 20 different places in the New Testament where this passage is alluded to or quoted or referred to. It has been called by many the Psalm of the Cross. Now, commentators debate what kind of psalm this is. Is this what's called a a typical psalm? That is, David writes beyond his experience, and that becomes a representative of the Lord. Or is it pure prophecy? On one level, it doesn't matter. Uh, It is clearly talking in the intention of God about the death of our Lord Jesus. And that's the way we're going to look at it this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 22. And on one way, the psalm falls into two parts. Verses 1 to 21 and verses 1 to 21 are what are called lament, agony, anguish. And then all of a sudden in verse 20, well, end of verse 21 and verse 22 to 31, the whole mood changes. And you have celebration, and you have joy. That's why the title, Agony and then Ecstasy. But we're going to look at it in three parts. And so first of all, let's read verses 1 to 10. The agony of abandonment. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, which is apparently a tune to which this was sung, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from from saving me from the words of my groaning? Or roaring is a word that could be translated that the same as words used later of a lion. Oh my God, I cried by day. You don't answer. And by night and I find no rest. Yet you, but you, are holy. Enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who seek me mock. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. He delights in him. Yet you, but you, are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust in you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You've been my God. One of life's hardest experiences is to find yourself in a situation that is overwhelming and utterly beyond you. And to feel that nobody understands. And there's nobody else who can help. And you're not even sure that there's anybody who really cares. And sometimes you'll find yourself in that situation. And you feel this awful reality that I'm on my own. And that sense of being on my own is only doubled down if I sense that God isn't paying attention. Where's God? I don't think he's dead, but is he deaf? Because he's not responding to my cry. And in some amazing way, that is the experience of of our Lord Jesus. In in these first 21 verses, we're going to see this going back and forth between utter despair and a kind of confused confidence. He'll lament, and yet at the same time, but but I I know this about you. How, How do I put those two things together? So let's walk our way into the psalm. We're met by this cry of abandonment. This this sense of forsakenness in these first five verses. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we remember that that's precisely the cry of Jesus on the cross. It's even given to us in Aramaic in the uh, Gospels. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Because the writer wanted us to recognize something of the roots of this back there. In one sense, it's a cry of faith. My God, my God. This is not someone who denies the existence of God. This one is not someone who's indifferent to God. My God. Three times in the first two verses, he'll call out to my God. And it's, as I've already said, a cry of innocence. Why have you forsaken me? I, I, I have no sin I need to confess. I have no wrongdoing of my own that I am bringing before you. It's a cry of, of distress. He's not asking for an explanation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, son, here's the reason. We know that's not that kind of question. It's a wail from his heart about what's going on. How, how do I understand this? And it's also in some remarkable way that we only realize in light of the New Testament, it's a cry of judgment. But what I mean by that is, as we read through the New Testament, this is the only time in all of his life that Jesus ever addressed his Father in heaven as God. It was always my Father. Father. But at this moment, he is before God as his judge. As the one who is seeing him in some way as worthy of judgment and the mystery of it all. And he feels utterly and totally alone as he roars out to God in his pain and in his distress. And what makes it even worse is he knows that's not who the God of Scripture is. That's why the cry of confusion comes in verses 3 to 5. After this cry of distress, we have this, yet you, but you, but you of all people, you're holy. You're enthroned on the praises of Israel. You're holy and you're sovereign. I don't understand how a holy God can make me endure this. You're not like the pagan gods. You're a holy God. And not only are you holy, you are faithful. You've got a track record of helping your people when they called upon you in your distress and in your need. In you, our fathers trusted. They, they trusted and you delivered them. In you, they cried. To you, they cried. And they were rescued. To you, in you, they trusted. They weren't put to shame. Why me when that wasn't the way for them? This is a cry of someone who doesn't just feel abandoned and forsaken. He is in some profound way abandoned and forsaken. Having expressed his confusion, he comes back and describes himself. He is, to use the words of Isaiah, the despised and the rejected one, surrounded by people who are harassing him and attacking him, abandoned by God, attacked by people. So the attacks are described. I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. And it wasn't until I thought about that this week that I've always recognized the statement, I'm a, a worm. And uh, my instinct is to think what you instinctively think of as an earthworm. Weak, slimy, good for fishing, but not for a lot of other things, except for making your garden grow and so forth. But I don't think that's the worm he's talking about. I think the worm he's talking about is an agricultural pest. You know, the kind of worm that gets in a crop and utterly destroys it? 
there's a group, of, uh, uh, there's a, a, a plague of somehow army worms have gotten from South America over to Africa, and there are concerns that they're bringing famine to areas. Any farmer knows that you are concerned about pests. It isn't that they just view him as a worm, creepy and helpless, but as a danger. And some of you who know something about agriculture know how, uh, and, and you've got stations here when you get into California. Why? Because they're trying to keep out worms. So Jesus is saying, that's how I'm viewed, not as something simply unattractive and ugly, but something that is a danger to the world around me. And then he goes on and says, um, I'm the object of derision and shame. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads in disgust and in contempt. And they taunt me. He trusts in Yahweh. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. <laughs> Supposedly God delights in him. And we hear the crowds. We hear the Soldiers mocking Jesus. We hear the crowds filling the streets, taunting him. We hear those at the cross. <laughs> you who's going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him. And Matthew depicts almost precisely the picture we have here of the contempt and shame that Jesus died. Ridiculed, mocked, rejected. We've seen pictures of it. It angers Americans when they see soldiers who've been brought down and then we see the enemy, if the army is unable to carry its military, taking them through the streets and deriding and mocking and, and taunting and trying to shame them in those ways, and Jesus feels himself in that position as he's on the cross. And then again, the confusion, or at least the apparent contradiction, as he describes, but you, again, the second ESV translates it, yet you, I, I think, but you, but we had it in verse 3, we have it here, we'll have it again, but you, you were he who took me from the womb. You were kind of my midwife. You, you were there even as I was born. You, you caught me when I dropped. You, you protected me. You made me trust in you. At my mother's breast. I knew I was cast from my birth, from my mother's womb. You've been my God. All of these years, I've known you were there when I needed you, and you were there. And where are you now? So now in verse 11, we have the second part. Some of your Bibles will put verse 11 with verse 10, some with verse 12. For the sake of argument here, let me put it with verse 12. And now he is describing the agony, not so much of being forsaken, but the agony of physical suffering and pain. And yet, in the midst of it all, it's, where is my father in all of this? So verses 11 as it, to 18, as it were, plot the, the progress as death draws closer and closer. There's another cry. Be not far from me. Trouble is near. There's none to help. I've got no one to look, but, where to look but you. His disciples may have been stunned looking there before him, but they could not help him. And then he describes his encircling enemies. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. 
The bulls of Bashan were known for their strength and their power. Bashan is what we know today as the Golan Heights. It's pasture land, and it's where the best of the animals were bred and kept and raised. And so these powerful bulls, and he feels like a matador is it were in the midst, but not with one to face, but surrounded and encircled and they mean nothing good, and yet they're not simply that. They are roaring lions announcing that they are about to enjoy a meal. And the reality of the powerlessness of Jesus, a chosen powerlessness. He'd said to, to Pilate, I could call God, and he would send 12 legions of angels but he's made himself utterly helpless. And then the excruciating pain. And now as we begin to read, some of the wonder of this comes true. There were things like impaling people at the time of David, but crucifixion wasn't introduced into the land of Israel until the Romans bought it in the time of Mark Antony. So for less than 100 years, crucifixions had been going on, and this remarkably fits the picture of a crucified person with the piercing and the impaling and the being out and all of these other parts to it. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint impaled there and trying with his hands and his feet. And feeling wrenched in his shoulders and pushing himself up so he could breathe because you died on the cross by asphyxiation. That's why later they will come and they will break the legs of the prisoners on the cross because... That way they couldn't push themselves up to clear their lung. And so he's feeling the pain and the weakness as it travels through him. And then we read, my heart's like wax. It's melted within my breast. And as asphyxiation and pain is setting in, we can imagine his heart racing quicker and quicker and all of the experience that is coming in that way. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. That doesn't tell us anything. A potsherd is a piece of, a broken baked piece of clay. So a potsherd means a shard, a broken piece of pot that was left lying. When you do archaeology in Israel, you find these broken pieces of pottery all over the place. In our case, it would probably be like a throwaway piece of plastic filling the ocean somewhere but he feels utterly broken and torn apart. And my stung, tongue sticks to my jaws. And you hear the cry, I thirst. I thirst. And they give him that attempted drink of something to take the pain and he refuses it but and he's dying and then this remarkable statement you lay me in the depths of death they're doing this but i am dying because of you you're in this because you are god and lord And then he describes approaching death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me. You need to understand these dogs are not family pets. They didn't have dogs in that way as family pets. Dogs were scavengers, and they were vicious scavengers. And they were not liked by people. They were more like jackals than what we think of as dogs. And the idea that when somebody was uh, being surrounded by dogs, it's like 
vultures overhead. So we almost get the picture better if you think of where the vultures are circling. They're aware that death is about to come and my end is drawing near. They've pierced my hands and my feet. And what kind of execution does that describe? It's clearly the cross and all that's gone there. Zechariah prophesied the same thing. They will look on him whom they have pierced. But it was also just as he was uh, passing away that a soldier took a spear and pierced him in his side. And out came blood and water to say that he was already dead. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. John quotes that in John 19. To remind us that the one valuable possession that Jesus had was this seamless garment that he wore. That was all of the property he left life with. One seamless garment and some others that were useful for goodwill, but nobody else. But you, and for the third time he appeals to God in the midst of this. But you, O oh Yahweh, do not be far off, O oh, you my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. And he calls out to God in this pain and this anguish. Because time is running out and it's almost over. And then remarkably, the end of verse 21 doesn't read like we would expect. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Now, if you've got a New International Version, it will not translate it that way. If you've got another rendering, but in the Hebrew text, the other words that precede this, come quickly, deliver my soul, save me, are imperatives. They're commands, they're prayer requests. But all of a sudden, again, for those of you who would use the grammatical term, he describes something that has happened. It's not an imperative, but an indicative as the technical term. You've answered me. In some way, in the midst of it all, there's this sudden change. So you'll notice now in my outline, I've taken this last phrase of verse 21 and put it in the next part because two things are notable. The two things are notable is that the grammar changes. So all of a sudden you have a description, you have rescued me, and the tone changes. From that point, everything in the psalm is different. Now the psalm is about celebrating. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of the land. What? How do you get from save me? Everything's falling out and all of a sudden, you answered me. The psalm doesn't tell us. And even when we read the Gospels, we know that Jesus died. He wasn't delivered from death. But God answered him at a different time and in a different way because he delivered him out of death. He didn't deliver him by preventing death. He delivered him by conquering death. And so the crucified one, the abandoned one, now turns in celebration because God has answered his prayer. But not in the way he expected. 
and not at the time he expected. God answered his prayer in a different time and in a different way, and in reality, in a better time and in a better way. So we call it Good Friday, not because it was good, not not in terms of the ugliness of what happened, but because God answered him and raised him from the dead. There's something about prayer here. We'll come back to this in a little bit, but it's one of the realities in our life, and many of us can testify to this in many different experiences. We've called out to God, and apparently he's not answered us, but now we look back and think, you know, he did answer me. But it was in a different time and a different way than I expected. We prayed that our daughter would be spared from death. But we're confident that God answered us in a better time and in a better way by taking her into his presence. Hasn't been easier for us, but for her it is very much better to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. So listen now as the risen Messiah celebrates. And one of the first things he's concerned about is us. I will tell of your name to my brothers. Who are the brothers of Jesus in this context? Well, you remember when uh, the risen Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene in the garden and he says, go to my brothers and tell them. Referring to the disciples, referring to believers. And in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the Lord Jesus and it said he was a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And then having said that, he became like us in all these ways. Scripture says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. That's us. That's his people. And the Lord Jesus now has a people who belong to him, purchased by his blood, who are his people who now celebrate with him in the congregation, praising him with us. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. He's using the language of Old Testament Israel. We use the language of God's redeemed people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And next Sunday, we will stand together and sing, Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. And celebrate with our Lord and Savior, his resurrection from the dead, and hear The answer is given in verse 24, for he's not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's not hidden his face from him. He has heard when he cried to him. And then he talks about praising. From you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. In the Old Testament, When God answered a prayer, your responsibility was to go to the temple and in the temple offer a peace offering. And what made a peace offering a peace offering is that it would not be consumed on the altar, but a portion of it would be consumed and the rest would be taken and eaten together as a community meal. And Jesus says, that because of what I've done, as it were, there's a sacrifice has been made and we are going to eat together. So notice the next verse. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise Yahweh. May your health, may, pardon me. Every now and then I'm reminded I need my glasses. May your hearts live forever. Is there a meal that we celebrate in remembrance of the risen one? Is there a community time where we come together and we sit around a table and we think, this is the table of the forsaken one. But God answered him and he's now the risen one. Well, I think you might guess what it refers to in our understanding of the gospel. And then... One of the things the risen Christ did was commission his disciples to go into all the world, 
and proclaim the good news that the one who was the forsaken one was forsaken of God to bear their sins and their guilt and their pain. And he is the risen one. And through faith and trust in his name, we can have life forever. So listen to these last words as they end. All the earth, ends of the earth shall remember and turn to Yahweh. All the families of the nation shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to Yahweh, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, all who die. Even the ones who could not keep himself alive, posterity will serve him, this risen one. It shall be told of Yahweh to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. He has done it. What does that remind you of? It is finished. And the last words take us back to the words of Jesus on the cross, celebrating that he's done it. He's borne my guilt. He's taken my place. My sins were laid on him. And he invites me to turn in my garments of filth and sin and put on the robe of his righteousness and stand forgiven but not only to stand forgiven, to celebrate the risen Lord for all that he has done and all that God has done through him, and then to bear that message to the ends of the earth for the glory of our great Lord. So what does this psalm tell us? It tells us something about the cost of our salvation. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. That we through his poverty might be rich. Or as it says in Isaiah in that stunning statement, in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10, it was the good pleasure of the Lord to crush him, putting him to death when he would make a soul an offering for sin. And so we come this week, and as we walk through the events of this week, we need to fill our hearts with, you love me like this. You love me to this extent, that you bore the judgment of God that was due to me. He was truly forsaken. Why have you forsaken me? As a man, he cried that out, and yet in the depth of his knowledge of God's will, he was truly forsaken as the substitutional sacrifice for our sins. And the promise is, do you remember the promise? I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never be abandoned or forsaken by God because he was forsaken for me. And so therefore, as the writer of Hebrews says, quoting that statement, he will never leave you or forsake you. Or you remember the last statement of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew before he ascends into heaven? I am with you always, right to the end of the age. Therefore, Hebrews says, I will not be afraid, quoting the Old Testament. What, what can people do to me? because I'm safe in the hands of God. And there's something here that is a lesson to us about prayer. God has promised to hear us. What Jesus endured, we will not endure. But we may feel abandoned. There's a difference between being forsaken and feeling forsaken. We will never be forsaken. And even when our prayers are not answered in the way we might choose, we can be absolutely confident that he will answer in a better time and in a better way so that we might celebrate God's grace in our life as well.